We're back. Man, I, I miss you. Last Friday did not feel like a Friday at all. It sort of threw off my entire concept of what a week looks like. So I'm so relieved to be back in our version of the space-time continuum. Yeah, our version of normal. <laughs> right, which has never been too close to normal. But it's our normal right now, and I've really been enjoying it, doing these almost every Friday except for last week. And we're back with a lot of people from our community out there ready to watch another prime live Grateful Dead show from the archives. Picked by our friend, Mr. David Lemieux and Associates. It's a good one. This is, uh, we've got uh, the Dead's first ever appearance at Shoreline Amphitheater in Mountain View, California. And that's pretty big news. You know, the Dead played big 39 shows there. It was kind of their home court for the last eight years they played. Uh, just a little bit south of San Francisco is a great place. Bill Graham made it feel like home. And uh, this is the first time the Dead ever played there. They were scheduled to play there in 86. Right. It was a little under the weather, as we know, in the second half of 86. So they canceled those ones. And then they finally made it there for October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of 1987. We have the very first show. So it's going to be exciting. And Gary, we got guests. We've got lots to talk about. It's a good, it's a great night tonight. Indeed. I'm really looking forward to it. You know, I was at almost every dead show at Shoreline. I think I, I skipped one or two for other purposes, but th that place felt like home. As you said, Bill Graham built it with deadhead amenities in mind. He wanted the dead to open it in 86. They were going to be the first act to play there. But that's almost appropriate to the Grateful Dead that you know it didn't happen exactly the way it's scheduled because whatever did in that world. But we have so much to talk about, uh, and we are here for a great cause. Uh, we are once again hooked up with our friends from Music Cares, but very specifically designating funds to a wonderful cause that we support for professional and personal reasons, the Neil Casal Foundation, which has just been established in the memory of a great friend of our family and a great musician. And we have two great friends of Neil's here and friends of our entire community here to talk about it. It is, you know, Neil, uh, I'm, I'm expecting most of you are familiar with him because he became such a big part of the Grateful Dead world, uh, I mean, previous, but five years ago, it was five years ago this weekend that the Fair Thee Well shows happened when Phil, Bob, Mickey, Bill, Trey, Bruce, and Jeff got together and played five shows for 70,000 people a night. And uh, between sets, they wanted some music and they figured, well, you know, we can't really think of the, you know, these are, these are big shows in the Grateful Dead world. So they, I guess, commissioned, they asked somebody to make some music. That somebody was Neil Casal, who had been around the scene for a bit. He's played with some unbelievable unbelievable musicians over the years. He's a very known commodity. So he put together this band with, um, we got some people coming in in a sack, uh, and made this incredible music, uh, Circles Around the Sun, and became an impromptu band that became a, a proper band. And uh, we're gonna talk a lot about the music. And Neil, Neil left us a little less than a year ago. Um, so that's, we'll be talking a lot about Neil tonight. All right. So. Why wait any longer? Let's bring in our special guests. Yes, indeed. Want to do the honors, David? We have uh, Dave Schools and Adam McDougall. Let's bring them in to wonderful people and wonderful musicians. Yeah, and in case you need a little help with their resumes, uh, Dave Schools, longtime bassist for Widespread Panic. Adam McDougall from the Chris Robinson Band collaborated with... Yeah, oh yeah, the pointing thing is, is kind of tricky, Dave, because you're, you're getting the opposite from the way you think you're pointing, but good, <laughs> good. But you did pretty well for the first time. <laughs> anyway, uh, and they both have had numerous connections with members of the Grateful Dead mm -hmm. and its offspring playing in various configurations. We're going to talk all about that, but it's great to have you guys here. Great to see you guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, maybe maybe the first thing we should talk about is is Neil Casal and the Neil Casal Foundation uh, because I think it's real. It's the reason we're here, and uh, we know it's uh, something that's very close to both of your hearts. Dave, why don't you get us started? And uh, and Adam, please feel free to jump in. Well, um, you know Neil grew up in New Jersey. Did a lot of his early chops. Played in a metal band called Exire. Played in the great Southern rock band Blackfoot. Um, and there he met Gary Waltman, his longtime friend and manager. And after Neil passed away, uh, 
we just felt like it, it's it would be a great way to honor him if we could give back a little, you know, to that area where Neil came from. Um, so what we've done is we started the Neil Casal Music Foundation, and uh, in order to get that started, we have uh, Music Cares backing us wonderfully, um, doing a great job, and. Uh, Jay Blakesburg has put together an amazing book of Neil's photography. That was one of Neil's wishes, in fact, was that someone curate his photography and, and get it out there. Um, and in addition to that, we are making a tribute record called Highway Butterfly uh, that I'm producing with Jim Scott, multi-Grammy winner down in uh, Valencia, California. And uh, we're making it with people who played with Neil, people who loved Neil and the response has been remarkable. And uh, those are the two main things that we're going to try to fund it, this foundation with. A book that can only be gotten through the Kickstarter link. Mm -hmm. And the record will be out, the, the book will be out in November. The record will be out this spring. All right. And we'll, we'll take this opportunity. We, we want to remind people that down below what you're watching now, there's a link to the Kickstarter that Dave's talking about. Um, and from what I saw today, I think it's doing pretty well, I think, showing the respect that Neil had in the music community. But um, yeah, I was very impressed with how well it's doing and uh, that's just good growing. Yeah, indeed. And also you can learn more about the work of the Neil Casal Foundation uh, by going to the link for the foundation. And that ever popular donate button is should be to the right of your YouTube screen if you're using a browser. It might be below it if you're using a, an iPad or something like that. But just look for the blue button because that's where you push and if you are signed on to YouTube, chances are they already have your credit card information because you bought something or rented something on YouTube. So it's really easy is the point. And we always say that if you if everybody watching this just kicks in a couple of bucks, mm -hmm. that's great. If some of you feel like kicking in five to 10 bucks, so much better. And those of you who are prospering and feeling generous, we will reject no amount is what I'm saying here. So um, we really want to stress how important this is, what a great cause the Neil Casal Music Foundation is. And also I became familiar with Neil's photography over the years and that could have been his main gig. He was such a great photographer and he did such beautiful work. Uh, and a lot of his photography was music connected. He took great pictures of his friends in music, but he also, just had a great eye, a great visual sense, as well as obviously an incredible musical sense. So that book is going to be a real treasure. And I, I really hope you'll get to pick up on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you're right, Gary. I mean, it's, uh, you know, he's published. Yeah. He, he published a book of the photography that uh, was from the road life he shared with Ryan Adams and the Cardinals. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing, this book. You know, it's it's something that I knew he was into, and and having seen this archive, it, it's just you're absolutely right. He could have, he could have done this, but the quality of the photography speaks to his nature, um, as a tasteful and fastidious person, a professional. Uh, it's just amazing to me. Um, I uh, I was on the road with him for nine years, and he always had his camera, and he managed to catch. He just had an eye for catching things that. He wouldn't notice as, as just a being in the world. I didn't really notice the stuff. He would just get something. He had a, a real sense of, of movement and, and it just was in him. And he was all the time with his camera. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, let's also talk about the music relationships with, with Neil because I was astounded to find out how many musical circles he overlapped with, how many different groups of musical friends and associates he had. Um, this was really underscored uh, by the wonderful uh, tribute concert done at the Capitol Theater last year, where so many of Neil's friends showed up and put on this really marathon. It was still going when I left, you know, well after midnight, because uh, I had a train to catch. But uh, but it was it was incredible to see how many musical worlds he touched and how many musicians embraced him and and admired him. So Adam, you had a long history with him. Why don't you tell some of the origin story of your relationship with Neil as a player? Um, 
I didn't really know who he was. I was with the Chris Robinson Brotherhood, and Chris said, uh, you know, we're using this guy. And I first time I met him, it was, uh, you know, he's, he can be a bit shy and stuff. Um, and until he knows you. And so, sort of we, you know, we were between the keyboards and his guitar, we really had to find a language and we had to find it quick because we were going on tour like right away. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it started to open up. And when you play together like that, you get to know each other. I mean, I, we could, we ended up at the point where we could finish each other's musical phrases. He always kind of knew, he knew all my tricks and I know all his tricks and we knew how to throw them in and shake hands with them. And once he opened up as a person to me in the first year, man, he became uh, one of my tightest friends. Um, we always went to dinner before shows. Uh, we both from the East Coast, we really connected on that level, that sort of grim East Coast thing, which I love. And there's a darker humor over there, which he totally had and I have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like when you come to California, sometimes the things I'd say that I thought were funny, I think they hurt people in California. <laughs> I think they got like, I could tell they were like punched in the gut, I would say. But if you say it in New York, like it's funny. So he, he had that, we both played the same clubs. We both uh, were in the same scene, never met each other, but all the stories he'd tell about playing in New York, I had the same thing, it was around the same time. And it's, I'm really lucky uh, to have played with him for so long. We became very tight. Mm -hmm. Dave, how about you? Oh, I, I completely, with what Adam just said about Lucky, yeah, he, uh, you know, the space that he left now that he's not with us anymore is, is just immense and it hurts. Um, but as time goes on, there's just so much great, great stuff about Neil that, that makes the hurt a lot better, frankly. Um, you know, I met him, I was doing a lot of work with Weir over at TRI and Justin Kreutzmann was working there and, and they had done the, uh, the large scale tribute to, to Jerry. Um, and there were a lot of photos of that up. And I'm like, hey, who is that guy with Russo and Jonathan Wilson? And it's like, oh, that's Neil Casal. I'm like, he grew a beard. What's going on? You know? And, but I had never played with him until we decided to create the Hardworking Americans, which was a band created to record a record of cover songs. Todd Snyder had an idea that uh, Americana and country songwriters, the poetry wasn't getting the respect and the musical backing. And since he liked jam bands, we all know how certain artists look at jam bands and he wanted to dispel that notion. So we put a band together with me and Todd Snyder and Dwayne Trucks and Chad Staley and Neil Casal. And so when we arrived to start day one of recording, the first hardworking Americans record was the day we all met for the most part. And man, we just got right down to it. And Neil's ideas were just fantastic. His, uh, his, his, the psychology of the studio with Neil was fantastic. The way he brought people in, never told them what to play, just sort of accepted something in a way that spurred them on to a great idea they never knew they could accomplish. And we did the record in like four days. The tracking was done. And then Neil and I had a couple of days by ourselves to overdub and fix guitars and tie things up. And that's when we really had the chance to get to know each other. And then, of course, we spent a couple of years on the road together, and and that's when you really get to know somebody, right, Adam? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean the studio stuff with him is I feel exactly the same. And we had such a musical partnership that when it came time to do the overdubs after the basic tracks were done, like I would be in the room, like right next to him when he would track his guitars, like just in a big room and I would have headphones on, he'd have headphones and I was kind of moving around. He would be watching me like, and then he would do the same for me when it came from my parts uh, and we could lace them together, which ended up being uh, really hard for the last record we put out because he wasn't there for the overdubs. He did amazing work uh, on the last day of recording and he played such beautiful stuff. Um, and I know that at the time he knew what he was going to do. Uh, he was already preparing, you know, so uh, it was beautiful what he played. I think he 
kind of knew that was the last hurrah for him on a, on a record. And, uh, and then me and Dan, the bass player had to kind of sew it up without Neil around. And it was really hard mm -hmm. to finish that record. Cause I was so used to having somebody to bounce everything off and somebody to, to write together with. So we, you know, it was really, it was painful to do it. I mean, I love the record, but it, 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 it was a cathartic thing. Yeah, it's it's the hardest thing to do to to keep going uh, when you've lost a brother, and I think this is something that you know I understand. Deadheads understand, um, and it's an evolution. You know, all of us like to create music, and I know that Neil feels this way because I watched his guitar solos evolve and his harmony parts evolve. Um, and sometimes that evolution is really hard. But you know, in the case of Widespread Panic. Mikey had cancer, and, and we did the first year at Bonnaroo. And then we did a couple of Shed shows, one with J.J. Kale. We did our Red Rock show, and then we did the Four Seasons Center in Cedar Rapids. Mm -hmm. And his wish was to, to go as long as he could. And it got to be too tough, and we woke up after a day off in Milwaukee, and he wasn't there. You know, we had to finish our tour. And, you know, just like... Uh, Dead and Company and all the stuff that's gone on in the last 25 years, it's like a band that loves itself, um, loves its music and loves its scene, the sound, the, the fellowship that happens within the core group. Uh, to make the decision to continue on is, is painful and hard and um, ultimately rewarding because we get to remember the person who's left, who inspired so much music. And, and really, I think the thing about Neil is he always brought people together. You know, Gary, you mentioned linkage, and, and I never would have really met Adam if it hadn't been for Neil. Yeah. You know, uh, there are a lot of people I never would have really met if it weren't for Neil, and, you know, this tribute record we're doing is, is has just been the most overwhelmingly positive experience um, in the spirit of, of that aspect of, of Neil. Um, people coming together, just like that first Hard Work in Americans record. All right, what are we going to do? Well, Leslie Mendelson shows up and she wants to do Feel No Pain. Mm -hmm. And she's got Bob Glob and Don Heffington and Greg Lee, who was Neil's backup band on his very first record. Right. And it, it's crushing. And it's not to say that there aren't tears. You know, Neil had a tendency to write some pretty on the nose lyrics <laughs> um, about the way he felt. Yeah. And those would go by in the control room and, and Gary and Jim Scott and I and, and Adam and it's like, listening to playback it's just like whoo boy that's hard but people need to hear that this music is healing ultimately yeah Heal, healing and an amazing way to deal with loss i mean we that that uh jerry tribute at uh tri had that element of like so much love being transmitted through the musicians you know and also so much care to to be to honor the context, you know, I mean, that was the thing about Neil that always struck me is that I heard him in so many different contexts. He always sounded like himself. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like he said, I'm going to be the blues guy. Now I'm going to be the shredding guy now, you know, but he always was appropriate to the context. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a great quality of a musician. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we learned a lot off of each other over the years and our styles changed. And he hit me to so much music, man. He's a his record collection was serious. I mean, mm -hmm. pretty much, you know, yours too. But it's uh, he really hit me to a lot of stuff, and he hit me to a cool way of a perspective of listening to music because he could trace stuff back so far. He knew the lineage of every band, and he had great stories about it. He was a historian uh, of music. He loved the stories. He loved the why this happened, not just the fact that it's great music, but why, what was going on in their lives, what was happening in the studio. Um, and yeah, he taught me how to look at music in a really different way. Yeah, he was a great teacher in that way. We were cutting tracks in Chicago and uh, listening back to some of the work we'd done. And someone said, man, that, that guitar's got a cinnamon girl sound to it. And uh Dwayne Trucks goes, Cinnamon Girl, what's that? And we just kind of <laughs> stopped the playback and like Neil Young, you know, Cinnamon Girl. And he goes, my dad didn't let us listen to Neil Young. 
you know, in the house. And so we just, Neil's like, okay, that's it. And he pulls his phone out and plugs it into the console at this big studio in Chicago. And, and everybody knows this is nowhere it goes down, you know, it's, and, and, and we'd have contests on the bus. Like how deep can you go with humble pie? You know, <laughs> are you really hip to Steve Marriott? And, you know, and then like listening to the dead, if you want to like talk about some linkage, we all have our favorite eras. Um, you know, but it's like, let's listen to 72. Yeah. Let's listen to 1972. Let's listen to the clean tones. Let's marvel at the harmonies. Let's, uh, the ev evolution of the songwriting. You know, Neil was a consummate songwriter. Um, but he did. He loved the history. And, and you could talk for hours about anything musical with Neil. And it was, it was like going home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We, hey, we have some questions we're going to get to in just a minute, but I want to talk a little more about Circles Around the Sun. And uh, well, it, it's, it's got a unique origin story in that it was it was cooked up as sort of a one off for a very specific situation. But then it turned into something else entirely. We all know that that music at the Faraday Well shows was just so appropriate, you know, to to just keep people grooving during the breaks or before the show. Um, but then you found another purpose as a band. Yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't even hear that music until Neil and I were at the first show. It's, it's crazy. But when we did it, we had to do, I think we did five hours of music uh -huh. in two days. So we didn't have time. And there were long songs. So we didn't have time to listen back to anything. So I didn't really get into what we did until Neil and I were at that first show. And I think they played it louder than they would normally play. The two California shows, they played it pretty loud. And I went to the Chicago shows too, but the, it was loud. And Neil, I remember Neil was walking down the steps and we looked at each other and it was just like, holy crap, there's 70,000 people and they were dancing. And, and I hadn't even heard the music for months. So, it was a really magical experience. Uh, I was a bit scared because I didn't know what we sounded like. I had no idea. <laughs> I was nervous. I was kind of hoping they're like, keep it, keep the volume down, because I don't know what we did, you know. And it was loud. And the first thing I was like, oh no, it's loud. And then I looked around and people were just having fun. And that was the point. We we made sort of stoner elevator music, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I walked into Chicago, I heard it before the show and at the step break in Chicago. I had, and I commented to a friend, I said, and I know you guys had done it. I know it was kind of uh, commissioned for the shows, if you want to call it that. And I said, I don't think I've ever heard more appropriate step break music. And, you know, I've heard some good step break music over the last 30 years at different shows, but I'd never heard music that was so appropriate for exactly the mood that the 72,000 people were in and it was perfect. And that's why, what, a couple months later when Rhino decided to work with you guys to actually release the first album, everybody was thrilled. It was, you know, unlike anything we'd ever heard or worked on, so it was great. And so now it sounds like the complete recordings are being made available. Yeah, uh, I think today it's, it's up. It's five hours. It's everything that was played at the show, warts and all. And it's, I think there's four or five, maybe five um, mm -hmm. tracks that I never heard that because we didn't have time and no one that haven't been out. And the stuff from the record, uh, Dan, our bass player, has been mixing that um, to kind of just make it sound like the band's kind of more on the floor. It's pretty raw. Uh, so it's it's good, man. There's a lot of... There's a lot of music. It's five hours. Cool. That's been, uh, it's up on Bandcamp now, I think. Uh, yes. Okay, cool. And I believe there's a link in the description below our little screen there uh, to the, uh, yes. Uh, if, if you go below where you're seeing us, you can uh, hit a link that will uh, get you to information about interludes, the complete setback break recordings on Bandcamp. So definitely check that out. Yeah. It was an amazing thing to experience in the moment in the venue and it's good listening at home as well. Yeah, yeah that was it. I, you know, we weren't a band and it was that response. I remember Neil and I driving home from the first show and people started blowing up his phone. And it was, it was crazy. It was the first time in my life that I guess you go like viral, I guess, whatever that is. 
-hmm. So that was the only time. It felt very exciting. And we kind of looked at each other and said, all right, like we're a band. What do we call ourselves? Uh, so it was, it was really, it was such a good opportunity for us because Cats, I think, even though there's no vocals, I do feel like Neil is doing what he does and, uh, and I get to do what I do. It's like being in your first band mm -hmm. and I'm old now. This is like high school. It feels like high school. It feels like you're doing what you want to do with the people you want to do it with. And there's kind of no rules. And, you know, we've been evolving, you know, we just put out our third record in March and it's gotten more concise and the songs are changing mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's good. This third record is like our pop record, <laughs> but uh, the one that's available for release is a lot of music and it's, it's cool. It was cool to hear that back because I hadn't heard it in, in a long time, especially the songs that, that no one's heard. Mm -hmm. Right on. Well, shall we uh, get around to some questions, do you think? Yeah, uh, yeah you know, we, so uh, guys, we get a lot of questions submitted by fans and uh, several came in for both of you, for Gary, for me. But uh, I'm gonna start with one for Dave, if that's okay. Um, and it's uh, by a uh, fellow named Chris Cowan. And it's specifically talking about the Hampton Coliseum. And this person saw their first Grateful Dead show there in, uh, in 92, um, just raving about what a great place it was, all the great shows that the dead played there over the years. And Dave, as both a deadhead who presumably, I'm guessing you saw the dead at the, at the Coliseum a few times in Hampton and <laughs> played there. Uh, <laughs> Your experiences at the Hampton Coliseum, both seeing the dead and performing there with widespread. Well, I could write a book about seeing the dead there. The first time I saw him was uh, 1979. Um, and my dad took me to the show with a buddy of mine and went and sat in the what I can assume was the, the lounge at the Holiday Inn while we uh, got a taste of something different. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw them every, it was like a rite of passage or a, a rite of spring, really, because it was always springtime. Mm -hmm. um, so we drive down from Richmond and we see them. And uh, I think, you know, uh, much didn't come to Richmond when I was in, in school there. Of course, the Grateful Dead started playing Richmond as soon as I went to Georgia to go to college. Um, so they'd play D.C. or the Hampton Coliseum. Um, and... I guess you could say, you know, we've all got that show that turned us. Mm -hmm. I think we all have that story. And, and it was the, the one from 1981. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just uh, powerful, as so many were, oh. and kind of at a breakneck pace, mm -hmm. unless it was a slow song, and then it was done with, with fragile frailty. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was toast. You know, it was another probably close to 90-some shows I saw before I got too busy with my own thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, to answer the second part of the question, the the time that Widespread Panic played there was going home and then kind of, you know, and I don't know, Adam can back this up, but when you start playing music, it's generally because you love music and you've listened to a lot of music and you start getting out on the road and all of a sudden you find yourself playing places. You know, there's, there's nothing better than seeing the Led Zeppelin Song Remains the Same movie and going, that looks like a great way to make a living. And then literally, you know, 25, 27 years later, you realize in the middle of a concert, geez, I'm standing on stage right where Jimmy Page was standing in that movie. So there's that, and there's playing famous nightclubs, you know, oh, the Fillmore, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was great to go back and play there. It's like, it's funny, those rooms look smaller. You see concerts in them, they're like cavernous and huge, and then you go back and play, and it's like, place kind of rinky dink <laughs> but it always sounded good there and it would get so hot that the the walls would be slick mm -hmm. in, in the the hallways and tunnels and you'd like don't want to touch that wall because it's slippery i think that's what happened <laughs> uh adam i've got one for you uh joe says uh you and neil spent large parts of your career playing with musicians where you know you guys were in the spotlight where you were supporting someone else's 
you know, vocal endeavors or, you know, we're, we're not the front guys yourself. And he wants to know what it takes to be able to, to bring your personal expression to a band, but also meld with the other musicians, uh, both for you personally and what quality you thought Neil had that enabled him to do that so well. Uh, Neil had a very generous spirit. I think just his personality, um, and he's a very vulnerable player. And I think to do that kind of music, the sort of jam where there's a lot of improvisation and you're putting yourself out there and he's willing to do that and I, I can do that and we do it together. I think that's a big part of being able to play with people. You don't lose your sound or who you are. You fit in by being as vulnerable as you can to the music you're playing um, and try to understand it and get in it. Uh, we played a lot with Phil and he, you know, he taught me a lot about stuff. I really, really, uh, I really learned a lot. And yeah, I think it's really just having courage, have an understanding of what's going on. You kind of have to find your place in it. It can sometimes take a little while, but with the players that we're usually playing with, they're great. So everyone's doing that. And when everybody's open, vulnerable, letting stuff in, putting stuff out, and listening to each other, it's the big thing. Everybody has to listen, which all the good cats do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how it works. Uh, you, just, you just fit in. Everyone kind of shuffles their thing a little bit. You know, you just rearrange your thing a little bit. But uh, mo um, we're lucky. Most of the people that wanted to play or wanted us to play with them, I think they wanted what we do. That's a big thing. They're not saying, man, you know, we're playing this song, you got to play it this way. And I've worked with people like that. And yeah, you have to like learn the part and play it right. And we've been lucky, super lucky, both of us. Uh, and Dave, you've been super lucky too. You get to do what you want to do. And uh, yeah, just, just listening and being vulnerable and being courageous at the same time. I think that works. And we, we got lucky that we played with... Uh, people that, like I said, wanted what we do. And we got to play a lot together because we did a thing, him and I. Uh, and people wanted the one-two punch. And we're very lucky that we got to do all that. Yeah, I think that, you know, you say vulnerable. That's such a huge part of it. Um, but you can't be vulnerable unless you have confidence that your buddy's got your back. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's something that Neil had. It's times where it just... In, in group improv, it, it really is like swimming in choppy seas. And to look across the stage feeling like, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and Neil's just looking at you grinning and his time was impeccable. Yeah. So he'd be like a rudder in choppy seas, just, just holding it down. And, and those people are really rare. You know, we're really lucky that we found a, another batch of people. And, you know, thanks to the dead for showing that that's possible. And the dead's heroes, the jazz guys. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, that actually, there's there's another question that dovetails uh, very nicely from that. Um, Dave, a guy named Spud, wants to know uh, if there's a jazz basis to influence you the most. And also, uh, are there musicians in any genre that you've always dreamed of playing with? He says alive or dead. Alive would be more practical, I would imagine. Alive would be more practical. Uh, the first part of the question is, yeah, sure. I, I love Charlie Mingus. Charlie Mingus was an amazing double bass player. Um, if there's any justice in the world, he will go down as one of the greatest American composers yes. of all time. Because uh, while his bass playing is, is skillful and nimble, it's also real riff oriented, which makes a blockhead like me pretty happy. <laughs> the music that it was underpinning was very deep and drew from just all over the world. Uh, and it, it just it it's transportational music, which is is really what I go for. Um, as far as like a bass player that I, I wish that I could just play with John Antwistle, you know, from the Who. I mean, that's that's my guy. That's that's the reason I chose the bass instead of the drums, which is what I really wanted to play. Um, you know, and and you can play with people who have an amazing skill and our listeners. O'Teal. I've known O'Teal forever, forever. And 
since he can play the bass like a banjo or like a rhythm guitar, it's great to have a double bass jam with someone like O'Teal yeah, yes. or George Porter Jr. You mm -hmm. know, these cats are close to my heart, but that's a great question. Thanks, Spud. <laughs> you know, you, uh, you came up with a quality list there too, man. <laughs> have you heard the Mingus plays piano record? Oh, yeah. I love it. Oh, yeah. yeah I love it. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 those, the, those of you out there who may be hearing the name Charles Mingus for the first time tonight, and that's eminently possible, look him up, get some of his music, enrich your life. <laughs> and yeah. watch that movie. Remember the movie when mm -hmm. he's in his loft and like, yeah. Yeah. Got oh, where he gets evicted and they're yeah. filming a movie? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the life of a musician in America. <laughs> right. They're right. making a documentary about you while you're getting evicted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Adam, we got a question for you from uh, who's it from 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 Malarkey, uh, <laughs> and uh, so it's about circles around the sun. And whose idea was the concept? Um, I know that you know the band came to you and, and asked you guys to do it, but whose idea for the concept of doing it? And the second part of it is how did you get to the groove that made each song? I know that you said that you recorded them pretty quickly, although uh, you recorded a lot of music. So how did you so quickly get to those grooves, the ones we're hearing on Bandcamp now, these, this complete recording? You know, there's not a really insightful answer for that. Uh, Neil brought in Dan Horn on the bass, who I'd known a bit around the scene, uh, but he's a wonderful cat. And uh, I brought in Mark Levy on the drums, because uh, I had seen him play years ago, and it just he stuck in my head as a great drummer, and I just kept in touch with him here and there. And when this came up, he was, you know, Neil said, "I got a bass player. We need a drummer." I said, "Oh man, I got the guy," mm -hmm. and he's got a real nice pocket, and he listens. So we went into the studio with nothing, uh, no idea, and we kind of went at least for the first for this music. The concept was sort of take take some dead songs that we like and that are kind of mm -hmm. seminal and just listen to them for a bit and then just kind of feel the vibe of what that is and then start playing. Mm -hmm. And we just came up with riffs pretty much on the spot. Mm -hmm. And then we'd hit record and play for as long as we could. That was, that was the thing. By the time it gets to 20 minutes, 20 minutes of playing music with no vocals is a long time mm -hmm. when you're doing it. It's, it's long. I mean you're in a different time when you're playing. So uh, that's a long time. So we were trying to just do that. That was a concept as long as we can till we run out of gas on one idea, then shift to the next, find a song that we like, go in the room, think about it and get our own version of what we would think that groove could be. But the groove itself is, you know, our rhythm section, that's Dan and Mark and they kill it. And, you know, Dan is an incredible bass player. He comes up with the most interesting stuff and Mark just fits in right away with whatever's happening. The first beat he plays is the right beat. And that's how it happened. Cool. Uh, what was the second question? Uh, that was it. That was the second question was how'd you get the groove? So how'd you come up with the band and how'd you get the grooves going? So that was really uh, interesting, man. Thank you. And uh, Dave, let's see, what's this individual's name? Mitch would like to know if there are any future plans for the remaining members of hardworking Americans. Well, uh, you know, the, the future is uncertain. Um, so there are no plans. The closest thing we have is was the idea of having Jesse Acock and Dwayne Trucks and I, um, and probably Adam, <laughs> backing up some of these artists that have yet to record their track for the Neil record. So we have a whole nother recording window uh, that has just been pushed into uncertainty um, because of the COVID. But... Uh, I would, I would love that to happen. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life. I love the band. I love everyone in the band. Um, and as Neil said, after one of the early shows where we really sort of, we sort of cracked the sky, he says, uh, uh, this, uh, this car's got gears I didn't know it had. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of putting it. But, you know, for, for, for bands that, that experiment, there is gears. You need, like, when you're in fifth, you have to be able to get the six, and then there's also a seven, sometimes an eighth. That's and, right. And you know, when you hit those gears, everybody in the band kind of knows it, and that's a that's a really cool feeling because you don't you don't know with all this music, you don't know what's going to happen. 
Um, and that's the beautiful part about it. And having those gears is important. It's and knowing when to shift. <laughs> right. Drop, drop a clutch. <laughs> because we're all just sort of waiting around for that opportunity to fall and drop it into jet off take, I believe is the term. Yeah. Yep. Um, it, it, it looks like we got uh, a little less than five minutes left. And I, you know, something we touched on earlier, uh, and it's kind of a big reason we're here is the, the Neil Castell Foundation and, and the Kickstarter, which there's a link down below. So I do want to talk a little bit about the two projects um, that are exclusive, they're part of the Kickstarter that if you donate to the Neil to get the Kickstarter going, um, Highway Butterfly and the photo book. Um, you guys want to touch on those a little bit uh, deeper for another minute or two, uh, only because the Highway Butterfly really interests me, all the musicians that you guys have put together um, to make this Neil uh, tribute album. Dave, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, I mean, the, in the interest of time, the best thing is if you're interested in this album to go to the Kickstarter and look at the very thorough description of all the artists that are involved. Um, but they're all people. If I, if I was to list them, now i would run the danger of leaving someone out and that wouldn't be good but i can say that we released the video which was a it was kind of an idea that neil and i were talking about before he passed away which was me producing a circles around the sun record with billy strings as a guest mm -hmm. um, and billy when he heard about the project he's like i'll be there and he was the first thing we recorded with circles around the sun as his backup band we did a beautiful song called all the luck in the world that video dropped to sort of light the fuse for this Kickstarter fund. Um, and it's amazing. It's an amazing song. Billy really delivered it with remarkable intent. Mm -hmm. um, so if you haven't seen it, watch it. I think it'll, it'll poke you in some places that will feel familiar and good. Um, but really, we've got so many people. It's just like a who's who. It's, it's amazing. Um, so I would go there and check out the list. And, and then, of course, the book, you know, the book that Jay Blakesburg has curated of Neil's wonderful photography. Um, like I said, the, the only way to get that is going to be to participate in the Kickstarter. It's not going to be in the stores. Mm -hmm. um, the record will be in stores. It'll be out this spring or whenever the pandemic lets us finish it. Um, but, but that's it. It's all about getting instruments and mental health care into the Neil Casal Music Foundation. Um, I know what music meant to me as a kid with a single parent. Uh, from a shattered family and it saved my life mm -hmm. you know and I think that Neil would probably agree that that it gave him purpose and it certainly has given me purpose and if we can do that for someone anyone just one kid then we win but we'd like to do it for a lot and we'll do it by spreading his wonderful music around incredible yeah. Adam anything to add uh yeah I mean I I just think that the foundation is really important music cares is incredible they really, they go the extra mile. Uh, it's so good because musicians often don't have the best insurance. They don't have a lot of, you know, they don't have a lot of cash, a lot of the guys, you know, so they will help out. It's amazing how, how fast they'll help out. And also letting people know that, you know, musicians can get in a pickle sometimes, being on the road all the time, spending 20, 30 years on the road, it's a, it's a, it's a fairy tale life, and when you come back to the real world, um, it can be hard. And so, you know, so people don't do what Neil did. That's the whole thing. Don't do it, and yeah. and know that that you can talk to people, musicians, all of us. We understand if we get together and be vulnerable with each other. Everyone's got a story, you know. Everyone's got an addiction. Everyone's got something that that they can relate to uh so it's it's really important to have awareness that you're not alone that there are places that can help you immediately and you don't have to have life be such a bleak pinpoint where that's all you can focus on you need people to get your perspective shifted and that's what that's what these 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 fellows can do and that's really important Beautifully, beautifully put. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we're, we're coming up to the end of this. Uh, this interview, first of all, it's the first time we've had four people on the screen instead of three, and I think the traffic got managed pretty well. Uh, also, it's the most moving parts we've ever had to an interview, what with the 
Circles Under the Sun Complete Recordings, uh, Around the Sun Complete Recordings, <clears throat> the upcoming Neil Casale tribute and the book and the foundation. <clears throat> there was a lot to cover here and we thank you for articulating it so well. Just please discover Neil Casale's music in as many ways as you can because that is his greatest legacy as well as the photography. The more I learned about him, the more I loved him. <laughs> and I think that's true of anyone who, whose lives he touched. So much great music in so many contexts. So please enrich your life by learning more about the life of Neil Casale. Yep. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Dave. This has really been a treat. Um, this is a lot of fun. So thank you for um, sharing your stories. Uh, you guys are great. Yeah. And now, folks, if you look below your screen, there's a separate link that will take you to the Grateful Dead, October 2nd, 1987 at Shoreline Amphitheater in Mountain View, California. So enjoy that. We'll be back next Friday. You guys come back sometime, too, because yeah. we really love hey, talking. Guys, thanks for having us. Cool. Thanks, guys. Good night, everybody. See you later. Take me to shoreline. <laughs> <laughs>